You know, when it comes to psychology, there's no better touchstone to the ancients than the stars. I'll argue this till the end of days. You know, languages change, foods change, cultures change, religions change, morality changes. But that steady pattern of the stars, man, that's been going for millions of years. That don't change. If I go stand in my backyard, I look straight up, I see the same sky somebody 21,000 years ago standing in that same spot saw. Okay, you can't say that about anything else, all right? Now, you can take this even further and say that the ancients used these to navigate. And there's no question the ancients used the stars to navigate. Bugs use the stars to navigate. So I'm going to say if a dung beetle today can figure out how to use the stars to navigate, that a proto-human a few million years ago was probably using the stars to navigate. Again, a solid touchstone. That proto-human looking up at the three stars in Orion's belt and me looking up at the three stars in Orion's belt is a psychological and mental connection through time based on those stars that you're not going to find anywhere else. In addition to this, the stars were the first esoteric knowledge, another hill that I'll die on. If you were a person that sussed, hmm, when the stars house the sun and it rises, the, the sun rises into this group of stars and it's time to go plant, or the sun rises into that group of stars and it's time to go hunt buffalo, pretty quick you didn't have to plant, you didn't have to hunt buffalo, you just sat on your butt and they brought you the food. Because you were worth 10 people's labor easily because you told them where to go and when to do it. And if you hid that knowledge and kept it to yourself and taught it to your kids, well, you could set up a lineage of people who basically sat on their butts for a living, right? So first esoteric knowledge, clearly end of story in my mind, there is no arguing it. And we can say for certain that the ancients looked very closely at this. By the time of the ancient Greeks, they started determining what the planets were because everything else spins in a set circle and the planets just kind of do their own thing. So they were the wanderers. Um, they determined uh, that the earth was round. Okay, Th They determined a lot of things a very long time ago. But one of the things that they determined was called precession of the equinoxes. And this is a pretty complicated one and... While, it's determined, while it is something that can be determined with ancient technology, it's not something that is considered to have been figured out until relatively recently, about 2,100 years ago. But there are myths, there are legends, there are stories that seem to contain elements of not only the soft data, the symbology, the symbolism of the sky turning and procession of the equinoxes, but... The actual, like, hard data seems to be encoded as well, the numbers. And this becomes a very interesting perspective. Like, did some of the ancients hide this esoteric knowledge in myth to pass down into the future? Some of the more complicated, some of the harder to find stuff, was it encoded into myth and sent into the future? Well, this is something we're going to take a look at in detail here. So uh, strap yourself in and let's talk about the ideas laid out in Hamlet's Mill and expounded on since then. Hi. My name is Dan and welcome to the Dunking. Now this idea first came onto my radar back in 1995 when I read Fingerprints of the Gods by Graham Hancock. He discusses at length Hamlet's Mill and the implications of the book and what he does believe about it. And he talks about precession of the equinoxes. And that's also the first place that I heard of the very real scientific phenomena of procession of the equinoxes. So I just want to point out that that makes Graham Hancock a science educator suck it. But Graham mentions where he first got the idea from. It's a book called Hamlet's Mill, written in 1969 by MIT History of Science professor Giorgio de Santiala and University of Frankfurt History of Science professor Hertha von Deschon. Now, the book is a hard read, man. I often compare it to wading through a sewer looking for diamonds. I mean, it feels like they made it hard to suss on purpose. It's just, it feels really deliberately, obtusely hard to read. I don't know how else to put it. It's like most people that I've talked to that are aware of the work aren't haven't read the book. And there's a reason, man. It's a hard one. However, if you do look through the book, it does lay out in a pretty good degree of detail, the idea of mythology carrying forward hard astronomical data. And the idea behind that is, is a myth that's got some hard data in it, some numbers, for example, is going to be, there's a small chance of that changing. If you give it religious or cultural significance, make it spiritual, make it sacred, 
The odds of it changing a lot go down considerably is, is the base hypothesis here. Now the big information that's said to be encoded by myth in Hamlet's mill would be precession of the equinoxes. And for those of you who aren't aware, precession of the equinoxes is the slow change in the zodiacal symbols that mark the four main astronomical days of the year, the summer and winter solstices and the spring and autumn equinoxes. The spring equinox is especially noteworthy as the age of the era is determined by which symbol of the zodiac the sun rises into on the spring or vernal equinox. The 12 signs of the zodiac are more or less evenly spaced and each one occupies about 30 degrees of the horizon. The four points on a clock seem to be based on the four signs that house the equinoxes and solstices, four main points on a circle of 12 points, and these are believed to have been the four corners of the heavens or four corners of the earth by many. Now at any rate, as time progresses, these symbols slowly change. You see the earth doesn't just fly around the sun and spin on its axis. It also wobbles as it spins, like a top, a slow backwards rotation. This changes once every 71.6 years, imperceptible in a single lifetime and in ancient times when the world wasn't as kind to humans and modern medicine and antibiotics wasn't a thing, maybe two lifetimes passed per degree. About every 2,160 years, the constellations change, and a new age will be named after the constellation that's now housing the sun when it rises in the spring equinox. For example, today we live near the end of the age of Pisces and the beginning of the age of Aquarius. And when this happens, the entire zodiac changes, not just one sign. The entire framework of the clock in the sky shifts. And now those four main points are occupied by new constellations. Now this was supposedly first discerned in 127 BC by the Greek astronomer Hipparchus. But there are signs that it was known long before that. Now some of the oldest depictions that we see of the zodiac seem to be in cave paintings and art. For example, in the Lasso Caves, we see what's almost certainly Taurus. These dots above it are almost certainly the Pleiades, and that marks it almost certainly as Taurus. Now, those Lasso Cave paintings were said to have been painted between 15,000 and 17,000 years ago, and during that time frame, Taurus would have been in the autumn equinox. That's a big deal because you're going to have four points that have constellations in those days. So if you assume that 17,000 years ago was when people first started naming those constellations the Zodiac, which personally I believe it went back much further than that. But we'll just say 17,000 years ago is when it first started and the Lasso Cave painting shows us the first time that people actually looked up at the sky and said, ah, there's an animal in the sky. It was one of the four main points on the clock. This is important to note because you've got 12 points on the clock. So as times change, at least 8,000 years or 6,300 years, 400 years would have to pass for us to have named all the constellations. So that has to go back a long time. And the constellations pretty much show up wholesale, completely done by the time of the Greeks, right? There's, there's a couple of outliers, but basically you've got the 12 pieces of the sky are equally sectioned out by the time of the Greeks, so at least 6,000 years before that. So having established that there's a very good chance that the Zodiac is much older than considered accepted by mainstream historians, let's go ahead and dig into the claims of Hamlet's Mill and other associated people like Graham Hancock. Amlody's Mill is an old Scandinavian legend that is used as the main idea behind Hamlet's Mill and it's basically a story of a mill that is affixed with four supporting bars that eventually breaks free from the supports. The imagery is plain. There's a spinning disc that breaks its four corners that are believed to be a metaphor for the cosmic changes in the sky. The supplanting of the four corners of the zodiac. The solstices and equinoxes all finding new constellations housing them when the sun rises. A change to the cosmic mill. And this idea is not limited to just a few Nordic myths. It seems to pop up across the ancient world, and quite frequently when it does, it shows up alongside the imagery of a spinning disk with hard data. Now it takes 71.6 years for the sky to shift one degree thanks to precession of the equinoxes, as I said earlier, and that's almost imperceptible in a single lifetime. But if you round that up to 72, we find that number quite frequently in ancient myths and the numbers 108 and 54 often show up alongside the symbolism of the spinning disk. 108 is 72 plus half of 72, and 54 is 108 divided by 2. 
Uh, these numbers seem to permeate ancient myths and artifacts, in fact. For instance, in the Norse myth of Valhalla, there are 540 doors, each with 800 warriors who may emerge to do battle. Uh, this kind of, like, begs you to determine which, which what the figure is, you know, what, what the end result is. And it's 4,320. And if you recall, it takes 2,160 years to change from one sign to the next, thanks to procession of the equinoxes. So this number happens to be exactly two ages long, and it happens to be associated with the end of the world, where all of creation is said to be destroyed, and the gods die, and Yggdrasil, the world tree, is shaken from its roots, and the, the, the boat's unshifted from its moors, and everything goes to shit, basically. And the universe ends... Well, the universe carries on, but it, like creation never happened. Earth is just kaput, and everything else keeps on trucking. Nor seem to have kind of a nihilistic but accurate worldview on things. But anyway, my point here is, is that's the way that the Norse looked at it, and... The data that's encoded in the imagery of the spinning disc seems to be very um, procession-y. And the fact that the symbolism of procession that happens to incorporate numbers that would provide hard data to go along with that symbolism is interesting enough. But it gets more intriguing when you consider that the end of time is aligned to the end of the ages numerically. I mean, two exact ages and there's the end of time. Well, look at that. And this is not alone just in North mythology, not at all. Hamless Mill cites numerous other ancient sources, and more work has been done in the last 70 years since it's been written, giving us even more insight into the understanding that the ancients seemed to possess. Now, the number 72 is ubiquitous across the ancient world in legend and myth. Osiris had his body disposed of by 72 disciples of Set. Confucius had 72 followers. The Hebrew god had 72 names, according to myth. Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, and all kinds of other beliefs had 72 as an important number. And we see this not just in the Middle East, we also see this all the way in, in Southeast Asia. If we go to Cambodia, we find all kinds of processional mythological connections. Let's take a look. Angkor Wat is one of several temples in the jungles of Cambodia, but the symbolism here is pronounced if you know what to look for. 54 demons, called divas, play tug-of-war with 54 angels, known as asuras, twisting a gigantic serpent around a mountain. This is to emulate the tale of the churning of the ocean of milk, a popular myth in Hindu cosmology. In this myth, the divas and asuras twist the serpent back and forth over that mountain. Eventually, the churning creates the moon and other items of legend, many treasures for humanity. And poison, it's also said to have made the elixir of immortality and the poison of death. Interestingly, the symbolism seems to align with the layout of the temples of the Encore complex themselves. Now, archaeologist John Gribsby discovered this correlation, and surprisingly, it goes beyond just the layout of the temples. If you were to stand in Cambodia and look straight up at the night sky for tens of thousands of years, you would see Draco do this over and over and over again, just like the symbolism of the churning of the sea of milk, of them holding the serpent and twisting it back and forth around this mountain. It's a very interesting correlation, and it's the kind of thing that seems to imply that they had some idea about procession of the equinoxes way down in Southeast Asia in 1600 AD, I believe it is. Now we see this sort of idea pop up in all manner of mythology all across the world. The cardinal points show up in symbolism and myth all across the ancient world for obvious reasons, but though when those four points are extrapolated into many more, and the story changes from four fixed points to one of changing, spinning, turning, and oftentimes the numbers associated with this concept are incorporated into the myth, giving us hard data alongside the imagery. The concept of world changes is also laid out in myth and legend. Moses and the golden calf is a great example. Moses and the golden calf is a great example. Moses comes down from the mountain. He sees the Israelites cooking up this calf, and he's like, hey, that symbol of Taurus has to go. We live in the time of Aries. Let's discuss the lamb. Let's discuss the sheep, the ram. And a couple thousand years later, what we get to, we get to the time of, of Jesus. And um, let me ask you guys out there, if, if you've seen other people's cars, what's the symbol for Jesus? And would that be associated with 
the astrological symbol that happened to have, uh, we began the age of it about the same time Jesus was born. Oh, look. It seems like this is ground zero for esoteric knowledge. It seems like this is ubiquitous and you can't freaking get away from it. So if you, if you look closely, it's not surprising that the more you dig, the more you find. It's amazing. When you really think about it, it is absolutely amazing to think of what may be encoded in ancient prehistory. Now, there seems to be an ancient method of dividing the sky, one that we still use today based on 12 points that was understood by initiates in ancient times. Now, this method may have come from one ancient civilization or several of them, and it seems they knew how to see deeply into the past or the future using the steady shift of the earth and the procession of the equinoxes. Now, we can argue about how or why those numbers ended up next to that symbolism all we like, but the reality of it is it's there. There's no question. This, this is a thing. So it does need to be discussed and reconciled. And you'll find that, you know, there's, there's going to be plenty of people out there. Oh, there's nothing to see here. Just a bunch of blah, blah, blah. But again, spiders use the damn stars to navigate. I'm hard pressed to think. I, I find it absurd to believe that when humans have the symbolism and the hard data next to each other, the idea that, oh, yeah, there's nothing to see here is ridiculous. But, you know, I could be wrong about that. I mean, the fact that these numbers seem to line up with the Egyptian and Sumerian kings list, and even in the Bible, if you start looking through the begats and start, like, trying to play astronomical numbers, you'll find that shit kind of lines up better than you'd expect. It's almost like this procession of the equinoxes thing was something that the ancients kind of valued highly as esoteric knowledge and passed it down in all kinds of things that we wrote about. But again, what do I know? All right, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. I, I hope that um, some of you guys love this stuff. Go look at the stars, man. It really, I can't say it enough. I go look at the stars so often, it is like, it's just good for the soul, man. It's just a way to, as Carl Sagan said it, we're star stuff contemplating star stuff. Go fucking do it. It feels good. All right, have a good day. We'll see you next time.